I appreciate calling it makeup, but it was blackface. Uh, and that is just not right. Yeah, it's pretty shocking, actually. We got to pay attention on who we put in power. I don't know, 18 years ago, you know, I don't think he, his intentions was to insult or hurt anybody. It happened a long time ago, but still, if that's something that he thought was all right at one time, then I don't know. Blackface bombshell, more racist photos and a video emerge from Justin Trudeau's past, showing the leader in brown or blackface. Full-on damage control right in the middle of his fight for re-election. Justin Trudeau apologizing for his actions, calling them racist, adding that his past mistakes were a product of his privilege. David Cochran has more from the campaign trail. Justin Trudeau tossed out his campaign schedule for Winnipeg and instead decided to hold a remarkable news conference in a public park where he begged for forgiveness. What I did, the choices I made, uh, hurt people, hurt people who thought I was an ally. Uh, I am an ally, but this uh, is something that obviously uh, I deeply regret and I never should have done. In the past day, pictures and videos of three separate instances of Trudeau wearing blackface have been made public. When asked repeatedly if this was the extent of the scandal, Trudeau wouldn't give a firm answer. I am wary of of uh, being definitive about this because the uh, recent pictures that came out, I had not remembered. Instead, he promised to do better, said these past failings were a product of him being raised wealthy, white, and privileged. The fact is, I, I, uh, I didn't understand how hurtful this is to people who live with discrimination every single day. Uh, I have always acknowledged that I come from a place of privilege, but I now need to acknowledge that that comes with a massive blind spot. Before speaking publicly, he held a conference call with candidates, during which he apologized and expressed regret for the damage he has caused. Several rallied to his defense. It was wrong then, it's, it's, it's wrong now. Um, but I'm also here to talk about uh, the person who I know. Uh, the, um, in terms of uh, how much he is uh, um, um, standing up for people. I think that we need to be talking about, and I hope that you'll be talking about, are all the amazing things which we've done for diversity. So that's the line. Judge Trudeau by who he is now, not by what he did as a high school teacher. But this picture collage of scandal has wounded Trudeau deeply. It cost him a day of campaigning in Winnipeg. It threatens to derail many of the campaign days ahead. David Cochran, CBC News, Winnipeg. An emotional and swift response from the other party leaders as they question Trudeau's judgment and integrity. It was just as racist in 2001 as it is in 2019. I think this has been a very difficult day. From the moment I saw that photo, it's, it's been difficult. How do you look someone in the eye that's, that's mocked the lived reality that I've lived, but more importantly, that so many Canadians have lived? Um, I think he's got a lot to answer for. So just how damaging are these photographs and a video? The Liberal leader has long positioned himself as a champion of diversity. Does this revelation change that? Farah Morelli has been speaking to voters today, and she joins us now live. Farah, is it resonating, or how is it resonating with people you've spoken to? Chris, it is resonating very deeply, no matter what, where your opinion lies on this. I spent a chunk of the day walking down this street, talking to people, and before I could even open my mouth, they knew exactly what I was going to be asking them about. Everyone's talking about this, and unlike the SNC-Lavalin scandal, the last big scandal to hit Justin Trudeau and the Liberals, this is something that people can see and immediately understand and feel, and that is why people are talking about it. And why that's so crucial here in Toronto is that in 2015, the Liberals and Justin Trudeau won every single seat in the city so a lot of attention is going to be paid into how to save face how to keep the brand as we get closer to the election three photos one video and countless opinions take a walk down Queen Street West and you can find a whole lot of them how are you feeling about it uh, mostly just hurt it's it, I think it's just more of a it's disappointing and it's a painful situation does it change your image of him as a leader? Not necessarily. I think it was, I think it was dumb. I think it was a kind of a youthful, dumb decision, but um, I, I don't necessarily think he's a, a racist man, but I don't know. That's also subjective. 
So I think past is past. Yeah. <laughs> forget yeah, about true. it. You don't know what you're doing when you're young, you know, and as you grow up, you learn stuff. The bombshell revelation of the photos and video of Liberal leader Justin Trudeau in blackface is a stark contrast to the messaging we've heard from him over the past four years. And that's what packs the biggest punch. I think it's, it's, it's inherently shocking, uh, but not entirely uh, surprising. Kofi Achampong works closely with Toronto's black and Muslim communities. It, it, it speaks more to a culture, I think, than any one individual, because what had allowed him to even be in that environment, to be in that um, outfit, to color himself, and to take pictures uh, without any sense of discomfort speaks more to the environment and institutional uh, settings that he was in. Because we do know that uh, for many decades and for many years, uh, people haven't understood the, imp the impact of imagery and, and, and uh, its relationship to uh, racism and bigotry. The big question today is, can the Liberal leader reclaim the image he's campaigned so hard on? My suspicion is that of all the things that have happened with Mr. Trudeau, this is the one that has the potential to do the most lasting damage, even with just a small group of Canadians. Um, you know, you only need 10% of people to update your views to lose the election. I'm torn. This isn't a good look. This is a tor terrible look, even at the, at the age that he was at. So I guess the question is, how do you be authentic? How can you really remain true to our Canadian values and what are those? And I think that is a big question for people. Trudeau has now apologized twice, once last night and again today. Now I recognize um, it was something racist to do and I am deeply sorry. <laughs> for that I am deeply sorry. Whether those apologies are enough to keep his campaign brand alive will be up to voters in four weeks. A number of cultural groups have spoken out against Trudeau's comments today, and we heard late today from an organization representing South Asian people. Far, bring us up to speed on what they had to say. Well, Chris, we got a statement today from the Council of Agencies serving South Asians. And essentially, uh, what the statement said is that what the Prime Minister did was unacceptable, it was demeaning and racist. But I want to highlight one particular quote from their statement that stood out to me, and we'll pull it up right now. Uh, the quote says, It is also interesting to note that the loudest voices right now that are outraged by how offensive this are this is is not people of color we really don't need anyone to be offended on our behalf what we need is non people of color to really look into the struggles of racialized communities and think about how they can be allies to our causes they went as far as to say this is creating a media circus that's distracting people from the real issues so an interesting stance from uh, a, a local group here and it's sure to keep this debate alive keep in mind this is just day two of this controversy we have four more weeks of the campaign to go and we'll be hearing lots more about this we certainly will Thanks for this tonight, Farah. To break all this down for us, we want to get Vashi Capellos in now. Vashi's the host of CBC News Network's Power in Politics. Vashi, big day for you, I know. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Chris. So this is one of those rare political moments that, you know, seems to supersede politics and get everyone talking. But what kind of an impact do you think this will have on the results of this election? Yeah, there's still a big question mark kind of hanging over that specific question at this point, I think, right now, Chris. I mean, definitely has has had an impact right now and could have an impact in the days and the weeks to come. We've still got, though, just over a month left in this campaign, and it's really hard from this vantage point to predict exactly what will happen. What we do know, what we can say concretely, is that prior to this, it had been, uh, you know, an interesting campaign, certainly lots of promises doled out by all the parties, but nothing really that had 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 sort of instigated the excitement or the interest of the public. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, you know, you, I think you can safely say has, has definitely turned the dial. Mm -hmm. And you touched on timing as well. These pictures and video, uh, they're from roughly 20 years ago. He's already run for prime minister once before. So what might be behind, you know, kind of the timing of why we're seeing this now? Well, it really depends on which one. I mean, I don't know the full story behind why the one that was given to Time magazine was. I know that the Conservatives were in possession of another video. They had had it for a little while at least, and then they the, they gave that to Global. I, th I believe the, the leader of the opposition said today, or leader of the Conservative Party, to, uh, to authenticate it to some degree. Global ended up publishing that today. I mean, of course, a lot of this has to do with the election, but there are questions for Mr. Trudeau as well. If he knew that the, these incidents had ha have happened, that he knew these pictures existed, why didn't he disclose them to his team or to the public prior to what's happening right now? And especially when you take into account what we saw south of the border last year, where so many politicians were exposed for wearing blackface in the past, you would have thought at that juncture he at least could have anticipated a moment like this, and it appears that he did not.
And you talked a little bit about how the Conservatives got their hands on that video. They passed it along to Global. Um, do you know anything more about the timeline there and when that video was, was originally in the hands of the Conservatives? I don't know the exact date, but I know it has been for some time. And I think the original intent was, I don't, I don't know the intent. I can't say that I know exactly what was going on in the campaign room, but I don't think they had planned to put it out this week. It was the Time magazine uh, event that, that sort of changed things. Uh, but, but we shall see. I mean, the other, th the other big question I would, I would put forth to you and your viewers is how many more exist? Are there more? Because as we heard the Prime Minister mm -hmm. earlier today, or rather the leader of the Liberal Party, I'm sorry, say earlier today, uh, he, didn't, he couldn't remember exactly how many more. He, he was hesitant to put an exact figure on it. Yeah, exactly. Lots to continue to watch here. Thanks for being with us, Vashi. My pleasure, Chris. Thank you. I'm Ali Chiasson in Parkdale, where candidates have been door knocking, and yes, the Justin Trudeau photos are being brought up. Coming up, we will talk about the local damage control. A black man who accused the TTC of racial profiling has agreed to a settlement. Reese Maxwell Crawford was pinned to the ground by inspectors last year. It was all captured on video and later prompted an investigation by the city's ombudsman. As Greg Ross tells us, the TTC says it's making big changes to ensure this kind of thing doesn't happen again. I apologize for the embarrassment and humiliation that was caused by the TTC. Rick Leary, the CEO of the TTC, says he expressed those sentiments in a conversation with Reese Maxwell Crawford yesterday. The apology in response to this incident captured on video in February of 2018. Maxwell Crawford, who was 19 at the time, was pinned to the ground by three TTC fare inspectors, but never charged with an infraction. It is my fundamental belief that the TTC and all public agencies have a responsibility to treat everyone with respect and with dignity. Maxwell Crawford was originally seeking $750,000 in a civil lawsuit for racial discrimination, while terms of the settlement were not released. In a statement through his lawyer, Maxwell Crawford said, it is very important to me that Mr. Leary has apologized on behalf of the TTC and that the lawsuit I started has been settled. Leary and the TTC now admit that Maxwell Crawford may have been the victim of racial profiling, but an internal investigation by the TTC in 2018 originally sided with the fair inspectors. The city's ombudsman later said that investigation was flawed and made a number of recommendations to ensure future investigations remain independent and impartial. As I've uh, previously stated, I accept all six recommendations made by the ombudsman. Leary says the TTC is also planning a number of internal changes to help prevent discrimination. They include modernizing employee training around racial profiling and how they investigate discrimination complaints against employees. Riders we spoke to say it's a step in the right direction. I'm glad that they were able to take a look into this and make the suggestions and hopefully they follow the suggestions. They're absolutely important, absolutely important, and stories like this need to come to light too because shedding light on that is what applies pressure to, uh, to our governments, to our political representatives to make change. Leary says the TTC is also creating an anti-racism task force, which he says will carry on the conversation by engaging the community through public forums. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. Meanwhile, Toronto police will soon begin collecting race-based stats. Their board approved the measure just this afternoon. And for more on how the collection will work, let's go to Natalie Nanowski, who's at police headquarters. Natalie, uh, police are going to, or people who are going to have to check a box and uh, say what race they, they are. No, that's not it, Chris. They're not going to be checking a box. That's the whole thing. That was the, the, the idea or the thought behind it, but that's not actually the case. So what is going to be happening is police officers are going to have to identify and report the race of the person they're interacting with in all use of force situations, including those where they pull out their gun or their stun gun. Now, Toronto's black community has been calling for this for decades, saying that uh, this city's police 
force disproportionately targets them. Now, this whole thing came to fruition after a 2018 report by the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal, or sorry, the Ontario Human Rights Commission, that actually found that black individuals are 20 times more likely to be shot by a police officer than white individuals. Today, the Chief Commissioner of the Ontario Human Rights Commission says that she hopes other uh, forces in the country follow suit. The Commission made this recommendation to the police almost 10 years ago when it had uh, an agreement with the police to work on systemic discrimination. Um, and we have seen resistance at every point. So it's really um, to see the movement that the board has taken in response to our report of collective impact, it really is monumental. So this, of course, is a first for Canada. And although most people are praising the move, some say that it doesn't go far enough because although police officers will have to identify the individual's race, they're not going to have to identify themselves. And what this means is that if they are disproportionately targeting, targeting a community, Chris, that their actions are going to go unpunished. Now, critics say that the force could be unfairly trying to protect its members. I think there might be barriers uh, within the force to this kind of policy. I think there's always problems when you might want to identify individual officers around accountability. There might be concerns that individual officers might be seen as acting in a biased manner or acting in a manner that's not consistent with the policy. So I think that there might be barriers to implementation there. So all of the data collected from this is going to be used to create policies to target systemic racism within the force. And this policy, Chris, comes into effect in January. All right, Natalie, thanks for this tonight. Peel police have identified the young man killed in a shooting in Brampton early Monday. 18-year-old Dre Rooms Peters died at the scene. Police say they received a call for gunshots around 2.30 a.m. near the 410 and Sandalwood Parkway East. They found a vehicle on scene with two male victims, both with gunshot wounds. The second person was transported to a trauma center with serious but non-life-threatening injuries. Police say they're looking for a black 2019 Honda Pilot in relation to the incident. Anyone with information is asked to contact police. Time now for a first look at your weather forecast with Colette Kennedy. And Colette, I have to be honest, I didn't have much time to get outside today. What was the weather like for people? <laughs> you know, I didn't have a whole bunch of time <laughs> out there either, but I can tell you and fill you in. For those who did, oh, I hope you enjoyed it. Just some beautiful conditions. You know, this pattern that's set up, it's because of this ridge of high pressure. I thought we'd take a closer look at that because I've been kind of talking about it every day. And it's here for a few more days, but there's going to be a bit of a shift in things in terms of temperatures climbing and humidity climbing as well. So what happens with high pressure, we get clockwise circulation. As it starts to slide a little bit more towards the east, that's going to push the flow up from more of a southerly direction, and that's going to help our temperatures to increase tomorrow. But as I say, the moisture content going up as well. Now, as it moves further to the east, as we're getting into the weekend, counterclockwise around the area of low pressure that's moving in means we've got two forces bringing that southerly flow in here. So we get even warmer into Saturday. Sunday looks pretty warm too. Some spotty isolated showers because of the humidity, especially southwestern Ontario, could show up on Saturday. But the main line that's going to change things over for this pattern is Sunday. And at this point, it looks like the clouds will move in, but some of the heavier rains may wait till later in the day Sunday. We'll be watching that because, of course, it's the weekend, so that's pretty important. But in terms of what's happening overnight tonight, we are just looking at some beautiful conditions for you. Nice sleeping weather. Temperatures right now at 21 degrees. However, overnight tonight, we fall to a low of 14 I'll talk about the temperatures tomorrow and the Humidex coming up, Chris. All right. Thanks for this, Colette. You're welcome. The Ontario Court of Appeal ruled today Doug Ford and his government had the, quote, legitimate authority to cut Toronto's council in half. Last summer, shortly after coming to power, Ford announced the number of wards in Toronto would go from 47 to 25. Ford said the cut was necessary to fix a council he deemed inefficient. It came as Toronto was already in the middle of an election campaign. The city and several candidates in the municipal election took the province to court, calling it an unprecedented disruption of democracy. In today's 3-2 to two decision, the appeal judges said changing the 
composition of a city council is undeniably within the legitimate authority of the legislature since it's a creation of provincial legislation. The city is reviewing the decision and will decide if it'll appeal to the Supreme Court next month. Canada's National Ballet School is celebrating 60 years, but they're also celebrating something else. I'm Talia Ricci and coming up, we introduce you to a class where for the first time, the boys outnumber the girls. The weather update is brought to you by Train Extreme Conditions Testing. It's hard to stop a train, really hard. Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's a first for Canada's National Ballet School. In this year's graduating class, the female dancers are outnumbered. As Talia Ricci reports, this milestone comes as the school celebrates its 60th anniversary. Throughout its illustrious history, countless classes, performances, pirouettes and arabesques, the student makeup of Canada's National Ballet School is changing. 60 years later, these are the faces of 2020's graduating class. People don't generally understand how much passion and perseverance and determination it really takes to become a male ballet dancer. I think that's definitely shift now. 16 boys and 11 girls. 
Even though he's living it, it's a ratio that surprises Ben, who used to feel like he was keeping a secret. Definitely there was, there was a kind of feeling of solitude, like I was doing this, this separate thing. I didn't have anyone who was following the same dream as I was. I kind of felt like at school everyone was going off to hockey practice or baseball practice and there I was with my dance shoes and my dance bag going off to dance classes. Growing up um, dancing, I always was um, like the only boy in the class. But once I came here, I just it was just like a whole new world, um, having so many boys dancing. And it's really just a dream come true, just seeing 16 boys and 11 girls in my like graduating class. Leveling out the numbers has been on the minds of those running the school for decades. When I became artistic director. 30 years ago, there was a lot of discussion about incentivizing um, male enrollment. But as a woman, I couldn't stand the idea of offering classes to boys for free and that young women didn't have the same opportunity. I thought, that's not the way that I'm going to do it. Genuine systemic change takes time. So I would say that it's been a gradual shift over the past 15 years. Stain says part of that shift was a result of bringing more dance into the community. But there's also been a natural progression of acceptance as male dancers become more visible on social media and on screen. It's so inspiring to work with these young men because they're passionate about ballet and they, they want to learn, they want to get ahead. They're not afraid to show who they are. And these young men hope the next generation isn't either. I just hope that little boys are no longer afraid. They no longer have this predetermined thought that ballet isn't for them. I, I hope that if any boy wants to move or dance, that they, they, they are free and able to do that. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. It's, uh, I don't know, 18 years ago. Racism, no go. It's mixed feelings, I guess. I'm Shannon Martin in the riding of Brampton East. We are here for a town hall on affordability, but Bramptonians, like the rest of the country, are talking about Justin Trudeau and those photos. We'll have more coming up a little later in the show.
I never talked about this. Uh, quite frankly, I was embarrassed. Darkening your face, uh, regardless of the context or the circumstances, is always unacceptable because of the racist history of blackface. I should have understood that then, uh, and I never should have done it. Trudeau in trouble. The Liberal leader apologizing once again today after more photos and a video are published of him in black and brown face. It is a changed election campaign, but a campaign nonetheless. With four weeks to go until Election Day, how has all of this affected the on-the-ground game for candidates, especially Liberal hopefuls? For that, we go to Ali Chiasson, who's live in Parkdale. Ali, you spent the day with the NDP and the Liberals. How did they uh, react to this development? Well, Chris, Parkdale High Park every election year is a hard fought for riding. But this time around, the Liberals are having to do a little bit of damage control at the doorstep. Have a listen. When people do bring up the photos of Trudeau, I mean, it's dominating the news cycle. What do you explain to them? So I say to them, look, I take this very, very seriously. They can evidently see that I'm a brown-skinned South Asian Muslim man. People have asked me candidly, you know, so how do you feel about your leader? And I say, I have confidence in my leader. And I say, I have confidence on this particular issue. It's the same line of defense other liberal candidates have given today. Remind the people of Trudeau's track record as prime minister. You know, we're launching an anti-racism strategy, which we did. I talked to them about symbolic gestures, like putting Violet Desmond on a $10 bill, but coupling that with $44 million in our last two budgets for the black Canadian community. I do have to get your personal reaction when you saw those photos come out yesterday. Yeah, so I'm a brown-skinned Muslim man who came here as a refugee. Uh, I have been myself uh, the, the brunt of racist taunts, racial actions, racist behavior. But what I know is, is that the images that I have seen do not represent the man that I know as a leader of my caucus and as a leader of this country. We also caught up with the competition, canvassing at the same time a few streets over. So it is coming up at the door? It is. It's coming up at the door. Um, you know, people are curious about my response, um, likely because I'm a black man. But I think also people are still talking about the issues that are really important to them uh, even before this happened. People are talking about how unaffordable the city is. People are talking about housing challenges and the housing crisis and the climate emergency. I think people have just seen four years of liberal inaction around the big issues that are affecting people's lives. And then also, you know, insult to injury. And what do you make of the apology? Uh, lackluster and didn't seem to be pretty substantial. It was more of a let's move on, let's um, move on to the next thing. And I think for uh, folks of color, we can't move on to the next thing. Racism is real, racism is painful, um, and it's really disgusting to see the Prime Minister um, perpetuating it. Is it frustrating that you have to have this conversation right now? It's a little bit frustrating, but I think when people understand that there are policies that are at stake, when they, when they zoom out and look at the big picture, they look at climate, they look at uh, affordability, they look at housing, they realize that this is uh, an issue that maybe is resonant for some people, but in fact is uh, a smaller issue when you look at the larger and big picture policies and what's at stake in this election. So it's tough to tell at this point, and, and it's tough to measure how this will really affect people's vote here in Parkdale High Park. They do, though, have two candidates here coming together on one issue, and it's that these photos are troubling. I'll send it back to you, Chris. Thanks, Ali. NDP leader Jugmeet Singh told reporters today the photos of Justin Trudeau in brown face and black face show the liberal leader lacks compassion. Singh says the photos show a pattern of disturbing behavior. Hannah Thibodeau is covering the NDP leader's campaign. NDP leader Jugmeet Singh made the rounds on television, radio and held a round table. And most of the questions focused on the multiple photographs and now a video of Justin Trudeau wearing brown and black face. Singh says he was jarred by the images and he was asked if this repetitive behavior by Trudeau made him a racist. I think that's a question Canadians are gonna to have to answer. I can tell you that I am deeply troubled by what this means to Canada. That young kids are gonna see not just one or two, but multiple images of the prime minister mocking their lived reality. This is so hurtful to so many Canadians. People who have faced injury, both in physical violence and in words, 
people who haven't been able to get jobs because of the color of their skin now are waking up to seeing the prime minister of this country mock their lived realities. Singh says these multiple examples show Trudeau lacks compassion. People who came out to see Jagmeet Singh and Hamilton say they are disappointed in Trudeau's behavior. For Justin, I think he could have been more conscientious with his costume choices. Even if he was just finishing teacher's college, he's clearly educated enough to make better decisions. And the fact that he chose not to kind of tells me that he's either ignorant or still has a lot of unpacking with his own privilege to do. It's not a costume, and that really upsets me. After the news broke, Trudeau was asked if he would talk with Mr. Singh. Trudeau responded by saying he had lots of people to call and have discussions with. So far, he and Singh haven't spoken, but Singh says he would meet Trudeau face to face and tell him what he did wrong. When asked if he would shake Trudeau's hand at the next debate, Mr. Singh said it was tough. He doesn't know how to react to someone who mocks the reality of so many Canadians. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Hamilton, Ontario. Next to the campaign of Conservative leader Andrew Scheer. Today, he also slammed Justin Trudeau and also stopped short of calling for his opponent's resignation. Katie Simpson is following the Conservative campaign. Justin Trudeau's apology is not good enough for Andrew Scheer. At a campaign stop in Quebec, the Conservative leader did not call for his opponent to resign, though he said Trudeau is not fit to govern, especially since he didn't acknowledge or apologize for all of the times he's worn blackface. Well, I think Canadians might have been able to accept Justin Trudeau's apology if he hadn't lied about it. But he was asked specifically if there were other incidences, and he said that there was only one other incident. Now we know that there are at least three. And uh, a lie ba an apology based on a lie is not a real apology. Shear confirmed he's never dressed in blackface or brownface. He says he's not lived a perfect life, but he's never done anything like what has been seen in the past 24 hours. The Liberals had been targeting the Conservatives in attacks on candidates over past homophobic or racist or controversial social media posts. He previously defended his team and said he would work with people as long as they apologized. Though today he was asked, given his condemnation of Trudeau's behavior, should he not apologize for comments he made in 2005 when he delivered a pointed speech in the House of Commons opposing same-sex marriage. Scheer declined to say sorry and deflected, saying today is about Trudeau's behavior. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Granby, Quebec. Colette's back now, and Colette, it's that perfect time of year when you can so comfortably sleep with the uh, windows open. Am I right? Yeah. Yes, you are right. <laughs> and it, we've got another night like that ahead of us, Chris. Great. Yeah, we have been seeing just very comfortable, very nice weather because we're in this pattern with high pressure that's in place, and that's what's sort of been protecting us and giving us the weather we've been having. Now, what is going to be changing, still good weather, but we're gonna find it gets a little warmer and gets a little more humid. So those overnights with the windows open, eh, I think you'll still sleep pretty comfortably, but you're gonna notice the humidity a little more for sure. Uh, just a quick look at what our average high is at this time of year, just over 20 degrees. And for a low, yeah, just there, just under those double digits to a single nine degrees for an overnight low. These are the current readings though. Uh, nice conditions, again, the humidity is still pretty low, so it's not that significant. We see a shift in the winds, and tomorrow as that southerly flow starts to kick in, it's what's gonna start to push up the dew points and the humidex. So see what it is right now? Ah, you add a degree or two, it's just comfortable. Uh, we're gonna be approaching that 30 degree mark with the humidex uh, very, very shortly. So nothing to see at this this time because that ridge of high pressure is still sending the active weather to the north of us. It has to go around. It can't move through. But things start to change up a little bit. Because of that extra moisture that we're going to have in the air, it becomes a little more buoyant. So you saw a few little speckles here and there of green. Yeah, there's just that risk into Friday afternoon, but more so it's going to be Saturday afternoon. See it here where we could see some pop-up thunderstorms. Very, very isolated, highly isolated. Saturday is looking like a very nice day. But if you're one of those people who experience it, you're going to be like, hmm, where'd that come from? So that's just that summertime pattern. Sunday is when the next system really moves in as high pressure is going to leave us. And 
so late Sunday we get into more significant rainfall actually coming our way. Overnight tonight, there are those uh, nice readings to sleep to. And then tomorrow afternoon, mid-20s in terms of how it's going to look on the thermometer, but you've got to think about how it's going to feel. And that's where we talk about the humid X being closer to 30. Saturday, even warmer still. Sunday, still warm, but things change over for that first day of fall, Chris, with showers and the temperatures dropping back to seasonal. Oh, goodness. All right. Thanks, Colette. You're welcome. Youth vaping has become a public health crisis, and we need action now. Just one day after medical officials announced the country's first vaping-related illness, a coalition of leading health organizations is demanding new national restrictions on vaping products. We'll explain what they're asking for later in the show. Justin Trudeau's history with black and brown faces has become the story of the election campaign. It kicked off just last week. Since then, we've been asking people across the GTA, what matters to you in this election? We had heard overwhelmingly that affordability is a top issue this campaign. Has that changed? Tonight, we're out in the community, and Dwight Drummond is hosting a town hall in the riding of Brampton East. That starts in less than an hour, and our Shannon Martin will be gauging reaction. Chris, we are in the riding of Brampton East. The town hall that we had planned for tonight was around affordability, but people here, like everywhere across the country, as you've been reporting, are talking about Liberal leader Justin Trudeau and those photos of him wearing brown and blackface. The reaction has been mixed. Some people saying it was in the past, others that it's unforgivable. And to be honest, a lot of folks here just didn't want to talk to us about it at all. But when it comes to issues of affordability, the increasing cost of housing and rent, they had plenty to say. It's young, and diverse. It used to be where families moved for bigger, more affordable housing, but that dream is now out of reach for many. Housing is very not affordable. They should make it more affordable. There's a lot of affordability issues here that are not talked about because it's the suburbs and people assume suburbs is a rich area and people are moving out here for the million dollar homes. But 
the actual facts are that even like townhomes are unaffordable at this time. Yeah, I'm renting and I'm hoping to buy, right? You know what I mean? But it's still getting expensive more and more every year, right? Perhaps the, the government can be a little more creative in the way that they can provide incentives for young people to uh, get their first uh, home. It's the type of place where everyone drives, commuting sometimes for hours to work and school. Traffic's pretty bad now, right? <laughs> it's gotten worse over the years, definitely, I would say. It takes me a half an hour from where we are right now just to get to uh, the 410 and, uh, and Steels in the morning. You know, you have more traffic than you have road space, more cars coming in. They're building up instead of outward. The province recently boosted GO train service between Brampton and Union, but riders are still waiting for two-way all-day service. All roads to a majority government uh, go through the city of Brampton, right? It, it's a, it's a, a city and a region that really does dictate who's going to form government next. This consultant and lifelong Bramptonian says whether it's housing or transit, the next federal government has a real opportunity to make life a little easier here. There's a little, little frustration amongst residents that well, politicians are more than happy to come walking in and out of the city of Brampton asking for votes and then for the next four years, Brampton really doesn't get its fair share. You have people that are getting on their feet, uh, you have people that are, that are starting their careers, that are starting their jobs, uh, and affordability like makes or breaks uh, whether or not they succeed. And Chris, that's what we've been hearing from people. They're living paycheck to paycheck here in the riding of Brampton East. So that's what we'll be asking the crowd. What can the next federal government do to make my life more livable? We'll have all the highlights from the discussion tomorrow on CBC Toronto at 6. Chris. Thanks, Shannon. Some former Conservative MPs who lost crucial GTA seats in the last federal election are trying to win them back. If their comeback attempts in these swing ridings succeed on election night, it's likely a sign that Andrew Scheer's party is on its way to victory. Mike Crawley breaks it all down for us. The latest GTA stop for Conservative leader Andrew Scheer's campaign, Etobicoke Centre. Let's have a big round of applause for your next member of parliament, Ted Opitz. Back in 2011, Ted Opitz won this riding, one of a handful of Toronto seats that helped give Stephen Harper his majority. Opitz then lost it in the Liberal sweep of the 416 last time. It never feels good. <laughs> you feel disappointed, and, and you feel disappointed more for your volunteers and start putting uh, the smaller signs down. But Opitz is now giving it another shot making him one of the few Harper government MPs trying to regain ridings for the Conservatives after losing in 2015. It's a, it's a tough riding to win, and, and you could take nothing for granted. Opitz could benefit from some name recognition, having represented the riding for four years. The same goes for Stella Ambler, another former MP attempting a comeback. My husband reminded me that I said four years ago that I would never do this again. Ambler had to walk that promise back with her family, she now chalks up her 2015 loss to the voters of Mississauga Lakeshore being open-minded. They gave Justin Trudeau a chance, and um, uh, but this time I, they're not going to do it. So I'm, I'm confident that it's going to swing back. Swing is the key word. Over the past three elections, Mississauga Lakeshore has swung from liberal to conservative and back again. This is ground zero, right? This is where we have to win if we're going to win government. In the last election, the Liberals swept all six seats in Mississauga. The tightest race was here in Mississauga Lakeshore. That makes this a must-win riding for Andrew Scheer's Conservatives. If they can't take this seat, it's unlikely they'll be able to make the gains they need in the rest of the GTA to win the election. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Mississauga. So what matters to you this election? We want to know here at CBC Toronto, what issues do you want us to dig into or do you have questions of candidates or parties? You can connect with us by email, phone or on social media. Email us at mygtaelection at cbc.ca. Call us at 416-205-6000 or connect with CBC Toronto on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. And we'll do our best to tackle all the issues that matter to you and the GTA in this election. We'll be right back.
A coalition of leading health organizations is demanding new national restrictions on vaping products. The call to action comes a day after the first confirmed Canadian case of a vaping-related illness and after reports that a fifth of all high school age kids say they use vaping products. Christine Bierak has more. Doctors say they've seen enough. It's time to treat vaping like smoking. Ban the ads, get rid of flavors, limit nicotine levels, and slap on the health warnings. In short, youth vaping has become a public health crisis, and we need action now. Health organizations say it doesn't matter who wins the upcoming election. All party leaders must commit to using an interim order, cracking down on vaping within 60 days of forming government. It's a step, for sure. But I think we have to take way bigger steps to like, because their kids are going to do it anyways. My boyfriend's actually sick. I think it's from vaping. As it stands, federal law allows for the promotion of e-cigarettes or vaping products on TV, radio, billboards, public transit hubs, convenience stores, social media, and newspapers. The health warnings are tiny, and the maximum nicotine content allowed in these products here in Canada is more than three times the limit in Europe. Add to that, many have no idea what chemicals are in those pods, making it tough for medical experts to figure out what's killed at least seven American users and sickened hundreds of of others. So it's not just one substance that we can trace this back to and in terms of that tracing I think a big part of the problem is that there it's very difficult to trace which exact contaminant is causing this um, because of the lack of regulation around what's in these cartridges. The Canadian Vaping Association represents hundreds of vape shops across the country. It's also in favor of restricting advertising and making sure all products bought online are only delivered with ID. I personally started vaping to quit cigarettes, which I was successful at. But like looking at the news, I'm like reconsidering it, yeah. Health Canada says it hears the call for more action. And while no clear link has been made between a specific vaping product and the lung illnesses, it's considering how flavors, nicotine concentration and product design are affecting children. But it's still reviewing all the information. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Beautiful shot of our skyline, and I can tell you a weekend warm-up is coming up. And after the break, Colette Kennedy will break it all down for us.
when I had it, I was like, wow, I could taste the butter, but I could taste the sugar as well. And the chew was something that was very different than a croissant. My name is Ora Herzog. I'm the owner here at Ambrosia Corner Bakery. We are located on Frederick Street in the central Frederick neighborhood of downtown Kitchener. Ambrosia is a community bakery. We bake everything fresh in-house. We make something called the Queen Amon and it originated in Brittany. The name itself is Gaelic French. It means butter cake. It's similar to a croissant, except that it has a lot more butter and a lot more sugar. And what happens when you add those two ingredients is you get a caramelization. Queen Amon's like a croissant or a laminated pastry. And when we talk about lamination, lamination is when you make a dough, you let your dough rest, and then you put in you put in a layer of butter, you let it rest some more, and then you do some folds with it. And when you're folding, basically, you're just folding the dough into itself, letting it sit again, and then you would fold again. You get this beautiful, crispy, buttery taste, and a strong caramel flavor, which is the sugar reacting to the ingredients. Full disclosure, those look beautiful, but I'm not much of a sweets person. You're not? No, I don't think so. How about yourself? I'm an incredible sweets person, <laughs> but savory too, food in general. Well, just if food. I buy any for the, <laughs> for the newsroom, I'll make sure that I give them to you. Thank you. You're Deal. so sweet like that. <laughs> you know, our weather's pretty sweet these days oh, too. Great. It has been. We've been seeing such a nice pattern, and it's going to carry on for us. We're just going to see the heat building a little mm -hmm. bit more. So temperatures are going up a little bit. Humidity is going up a little bit, too, over the next few days. So Kind of a nice last hurrah for summer. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And it is the end of summer. We keep talking about mentioning that Monday is the first day of autumn. So tonight we're looking at low around 14 degrees, looking at mostly clear skies. Chris likes to put the windows down. I sure do. He tells me. So that means <laughs> <laughs> you've got your nice, comfortable sleeping weather. And uh, tomorrow afternoon, 26. But I do just want you to know, like, if you've been liking it the way it is, uh, yeah. then this might be a little bit uh, getting too humid for you Friday, Saturday. I like that humidity, so I say bring it on. Um, but, yeah, it's going to feel not like 26, more like 29 to 30 degrees or so. All right. Well, I'll soak it in tonight. Yep, do it. <laughs> That's our show for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Mike Wise will be up at 11 with your next local newscast.